Happy this morning to have Gary and Wendy with us. Right over here. <laughs> Two more bikers. Yeah. <laughs> Do both of you ride Shepherd together? Good. Either way is good. <laughs> and also we have someone here that today is a special day for them. Catherine, birthday. Happy birthday, Catherine. And if you want to get upset with somebody with how I found that out, I can tell you after church. <laughs> Oh, it's so good to see all of you here. Uh, as I said earlier, I know we've still got quite a few people that don't uh, feel like they need to get out. And uh, we understand that. And uh, we're getting to have contact with them uh, with YouTube. The service will be on YouTube at 5 o'clock. So uh, that's keeping us all sort of together that way. But it really is great to have those of you that are here. And uh, I just want to say I love you. And I appreciate every one of you and uh, your unique contribution to this church. Uh, every one of us is an individual that uh, God has created the way we are. Uh, we're unique. And uh, every one of us uh, is able to be a great blessing uh, to God. And you are to me and to other people in this church. And I appreciate you so much. Okay, Philippians chapter 3. We're working our way through this book. We're going to be in 17 and through 19 today. So if you want to turn your Bible to Philippians 3, 17, you can follow along in a minute. If not, uh, I'm sure Michael will have them up on the screen and you can follow there. Philippians 3, 17. Let me say while you're getting there that... Uh, I'm referencing some material today from the Broadman Bible Commentary on Philippians, the Tyndale New Testament series on Philippians, and uh, using the interlinear Greek English lexicon, the new uh, or the analytical Greek lexicon, and I'll be using the translations American Standard, Revised Standard, and New Living. Okay, so I uh, wanted to recognize those things and. With that said, we will get right into verse 17. Here, as always, Paul is writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he says, Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. Paul begins this verse with brethren. Of course, he's talking to the brethren in uh, the church in Philippi and those in our day and uh, he gives an instruction here that can be interpreted uh, a couple different ways and I'll share those with you that maybe uh, may make us grasp it a little better he says brothers be you fellow imitators of me or we could translate it brethren join in following my example or brothers unite in imitating me now before we get upset and accuse Paul of being egotistical and vain, uh, we need to look at 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. And that is a qualifying statement for what he has said here in this verse. It reads this way, be imitators of me, here's the key, just as I also am of Christ. Okay, you see Paul can call fellow believers to follow his example because he is following the example of Christ. So he's not puffing himself up or making himself something special. He's just simply saying, you can follow me because I'm following the example of Christ. Now, Paul also says something else very interesting, and this is where we all come in. Uh, he calls Christians to follow the example of other faithful believers. He says we are to mark observe or to keep our gaze on those who walk or whose conduct in life is according to the pattern or example that you have in us. 
So this is what Paul's saying just in a very straightforward statement. He's simply saying, follow my example and the example of those who follow my example. Because we're all then will be following the example of Christ. And so that's a, that's a pretty good statement there and an encouragement as to what we need to be doing uh, as believers. Now, this is not a call to some vague religious practice. Instead, it is just referring back to the verses that we've seen before this. The, the preceding verses gives us the information we need uh, to know what to follow. Now, Paul that in those verses has claimed no achievement of his own. He disclaims uh, having reached the goal yet. He's still reaching forward to the goal as we all are. Now, it is his commitment, he spoke last week or we covered last week, to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus that he offers himself as an example. So he's, he's reaching out to this upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And in that, and in his following the example of Jesus, then he is presenting himself as an example to be followed. The Philippian Christians and the believers of our day are being called then to follow Paul's example, to follow the example of those who follow his example, and we're to follow him, listen to this carefully, in a commitment to the goal of perfection with no boast of achieving it. Okay? To the goal of Christian perfection, but with the understanding that we will never achieve it in this life, in this body. Okay? But, but the teaching here is, go for it anyway. Because what God wants us to do is get as close as that as possible. But because we're still in this flesh, we won't make it here. Uh, that's how strong that, that the enemy and his work and, and our flesh, and how it can work on our flesh, that we just won't reach that perfection. But it's the will of God that we keep moving toward it. And uh, I've said many times, and it's, I, I believe it's so true, all that God wants out of each one of us is to take the next step up. That's all. We don't have to think about next week getting way out here. It's just take the next step for us. And your next step is different from the other person beside you here today's next step. And so it, it, it's just good for them to take their next step wherever they are and you take your next step wherever you are and you'll both be right where God wants you at that point in time. Okay? So don't don't think you gotta do it overnight. Growing in the Christian faith is a <clears throat> lifetime thing in terms of the life of your Christian faith. Getting saved is the beginning point. And then there is the pilgrimage of the rest of it. And uh that's very important to us, it's very important to God, and it's very important as we see here, as an example to others that they may follow us. Because we're following Paul, and Paul's following Jesus. So, that's a good deal. <clears throat> now verse 18. He says, For many walk, of whom I often told you, and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Paul is crying as he says this. And he talks about the individuals that he's going to talk about now. And uh, it's a very serious matter. And he said they are enemies of the cross of Christ. So these are people that are in the church in Philippi that are believed to be believers. Uh, and he's saying they're enemies of the cross of Christ. That's a, that's a <clears throat> terribly hard statement. So let's see what he's saying here. He opens this verse with, for many walk. And we've already said that this term walk 
refers to conduct in life. So he's saying there are many whose conduct in life, and he's going to go on and tell us what about it. There are many who have a conduct in life that Paul has spoken often to the Philippian church about. This is not the first time he's spoken about these people. He now speaks to them even weeping, or there's tears in his eyes as he comes to the place to think about these people and then to express something else in a letter to this church about these people that are in that church. And, and he's crying. <clears throat> these people are professing Christians whose lifestyle is a disgrace to the name of Christ. And we see that they are a great source of pain to Paul because he's weeping as he speaks of them. Now Paul's uh, tears could reflect sorrow over the fact that uh, there were souls like this in the church. He loved them. He was had sorrow over their uh, condition. Uh, but he also had sorrow at the point of if they're in the church and people believe they're Christians and they're living a certain way, then other people in the church might begin to follow them. And that could be a great reason for Paul's weeping also, for the damage that they could do to others within the church. So, either way, Paul tells us that they're enemies of the cross. Now this uh, phrase is used to describe the false believers, their fate and uh, the character of their life. And that's what we're going to see in verse 19. So verse 19 becomes a very important verse for us because it's going to tell us the, the faith or the, the what's ahead for those uh, false believers. And it's going to give us uh, characteristics of their life so that we can know to recognize them and therefore not follow them. Okay? Now, uh, <clears throat> verse 19 makes all of that very clear. Listen to it carefully. Whose end is destruction. Whose God is their appetite. And whose glory is in their shame. Who set their minds on earthly things. Now, <clears throat> that's showing us the faith. And it's showing us the, some of the character of these people. Now, <clears throat> uh, First, let's look at the, at the fate of these people. Paul says, whose end is destruction. He's talking about them, and he's saying their end is destruction. The Greek word translated end means ultimate destiny in the way it is used in context in this verse. Uh, then it's saying here that their ultimate destiny then uh, is destruction. Destruction in terms of ruin uh, eternally for the future. So Paul is making a very open and a hard, hard statement here that the faith of these false believers is an ultimate destiny of eternal destruction and ruin. That's what he's saying. Their ultimate destiny is no different from the ultimate destiny of those who are out there living against uh, Christ, against the Scripture, and all of those things. They fall into the same category. Their ultimate destiny is the same. As I understand this, and I ask a question, these people were never born again, but they're just members of the church? Yes. Yes, that's a, that's a good thought, uh, actually. Uh, if you didn't hear what Mike uh, questioned or, or raised there was are these people born again and lost it or they just never were born again and the, the, the teaching that would go with scripture would be they never were born again there are a lot of people who, who are members of churches that we know for whatever reason they didn't get truly saved because there's so many teachings out there that tells you that if you'll do this and this and not do that, 
then you'll earn a relationship with God. And the Bible's clear, no one earns a relationship with God. So these, yes, were, were people that are in the church. They think they're saved. Other people think they're saved. And, uh, and Paul is saying, well, let's look at their characteristics. And then we're going to know where they are. And that's what he's going to show us. Okay, so he says plainly the destination is eternal destruction and ruin. And that's why he's weeping. Because he loved those people. He knew those people like we know each other. He started that church. You know, he, he knew many of them. And, uh, and he loved them. And so he's, he's weeping here. Now, let's go now and look at the fate of those uh, that he's talking about. And uh, that second part of this then, uh, Paul gives three characteristics then of these false believers. And I'm going to just do them A, B, and C, okay? A, whose God is their appetite. Literally, in the Greek, this says whose God is their belly. That's what it says. Now, this refers to their unbridled, uncontrolled appetite and hunger for lust, for more and more. Lust, craving, wanting more and more. That could be gluttony, that could be drunkenness, or it could be a preoccupation with physical and material wealth. Okay? But it is this appetite that is never satisfied. It just has to have more and more and more of whatever it is that's, that's functioning that way of their life. Now, let's go to B. He said, says, whose glory is in their shame. Now, the very thing that they glory and boast in is the very thing that they should be ashamed of. That's what Paul is saying. What they glory most in, we're going to see some examples of that in a few minutes. What they glory and boast in should be the thing that they're most ashamed of. It may be immorality or various immoral practices, or it could be the acquiring of great material wealth. Okay? So think about that. Number C. <clears throat> Who set their minds on earthly things. They are abnormally preoccupied with the physical and the material things of this world. And, and in another place in Scripture, Paul uh, writes and tells us to, to don't just think on the things here, but think on the things of, of heaven. But, but this is a, a situation in people's lives in which they're just totally consumed with the material things of this world. Now, hear me clearly on this. Paul is talking about a specific group of people in the church at Philippi in his day. And I understand that. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not trying to take the example I'm going to give you and say that was the example that was going on in the church in Paul's day. It very well could have been that he was referring to the Judaizers. Remember we talked about them. Uh, they, they were Jews that thought they were right with God, with Christ, and, uh, but they felt like they had to keep the law and be circumcised. So he could be talking some about them, and all of this can apply to them. And it did apply to them in, in that time. He also could have been talking about the Gentiles who followed the false teachings of the Judaizers. And they were believing that you had to have faith in Jesus, and that was not enough for salvation. But then you had to go on, and you had to be circumcised, and you had to follow all the law of Moses. And we've already seen that that's not what the Scripture teaches. But that's some of the stuff that was being taught in, Phil, in the Philippian church. And Paul is referring to those people. But what I would like to do today that would help us, because that doesn't really fit the church today, 
in what those people were, were saying and doing. But the same lifestyle is there. So what I want to do is just uh, uh, bring a specific segment of the church to your attention today that we can know and recognize. And uh, I, I want to say that these people are in many circles are thought very highly of. Okay? They are well known. And they are thought to be right on track with God by many, many people. And we need to know the example that they're putting forth so that we can know the truth and not follow that example. Now, what I would like to bring to your attention then is the extreme, and I want you to underline in your mind, extreme. The extreme element of the prosperity gospel and those who follow it. Okay? The extreme element of the prosperity, pros, prosperity gospel and its adherents. Now, can we make a case for this? I believe we can. And if you'll follow with me, I think you'll see what I'm trying to say. And I think you'll see that this verse of Scripture speaks to this. <clears throat> this particular verse, as I've looked at it many times in the last few weeks, and, and I, I have become more and more and more and more completely uh, of, of the understanding that in our day, this is exactly who is being spoken of. Now, <clears throat> Paul lists three characteristics. I want to list them again because now you know what direction we're going. I want you to see, does that fit or am I totally wrong? And if you don't see it, that's fine. You don't have to agree with me. If you see it, then that's fine. Okay? First, whose hunger is their appetite? Unbridled, uncontrolled hunger and lust for more and more. And in this situation, it would be for more and more physical and material gain. Now when you hear the extreme uh, prosperity gospel message, you're going to hear one thing. You're going to hear how to get more. You're going to hear what you need to do to get more. And that's their message. And uh, if you listen at them long enough, you'll realize that very seldom are you going to hear a message about Jesus in terms of a relationship with Him or whatever in that way. It is always focused on getting more and how to do it. <clears throat> and the people that are there, their mindset is what can I do to get more? <clears throat> Second, whose glory is their shame? <clears throat> the very thing that they glory and boast in should be the thing that they're ashamed of. And we're going to see some real hard, fast examples that will show you that in just a minute. <clears throat> the third character or characteristic is those who set their minds on earthly things. Abnormally preoccupied, in this case that we're using as an example, with physical and material gain. Okay? Now, let me give some examples. And these are <clears throat> facts and known truths about just little snippets of some of these people's life and some of their actions and some of their uh, teachings and some of their boasting that I think will tie them into this crystal clear to see that they fall into this category. What about <clears throat> the prosperity gospel minister who was preaching with a $6,000 red pair of tennis shoes. $6,000 pair of red tennis shoes. <clears throat> and there was a boast about it. Okay? Now, <clears throat> before you think that can't happen, 
look at some of these high dollar magazines, okay? And, and you will see things in there that, like, you can't, I can't believe that anyone would try to charge that for this. I can't believe anyone would order it, okay? But this is the truth. A $6,000 pair of red tennis shoes, and there was, it was, it was to be a boast. It was to show the blessings of God upon that person. Now listen to this one. This is even more interesting. This preacher was preaching, and all of a sudden he began to get off on his little uh, thing about how to get more money and, and the wealth that he has. And, you know, if you follow him, you can become as rich as he is and all. And in the midst of his sermon, he began to use as an example or an illustration the fact that he had a $16,000 dog. <laughs> $16,000 dog. And he was boasting of that in his sermon. And this is a perfect example of what we just saw, a characteristic here, of someone boasting about what they should be ashamed of. Okay? A $16,000 dog. Now, let's think about the ones that that are well known to have $250,000, $500,000 cars. This is a, a, a very real thing. Uh, I don't know how much Bentleys cost. I think they're over $500,000, so I can't put a price on them, aren't they? Oh, I thought you said that. <laughs> Does anybody know what a Bentley costs? I mean, the top of the line, they wouldn't buy anything else. I think it's more than $500,000. So I wanted to keep it safe at five hundred thousand. I've seen. That's the big, the bottom. Yeah. That was the cheap. Okay. Now, but this, this is true. Okay, I, I, I've seen the exact figure on on uh, one, and I've heard what another woman prosperity gospel preacher did. She ten thousand dollars. Three hundred ten thousand for a Bentley. Uh huh. Yeah, this or one. That I don't, yeah, I don't think. Two, it starts at two hundred and some thousand and goes up from there. And one of the top lines is three hundred and sixty. Okay, forgive me then. I I was certainly under the impression that a Rolls Royce and a Bentley was more than that. Uh, where did they sell them? I, we could go look at them. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea that they were only two hundred fifty thousand. Oh my goodness! Hey, he has an eight billion dollar estate. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's yes. a subsidiary of Volkswagen. Is it? Since nineteen ninety eight. If you want to look it up, what are Rolls Royces going for this day and time? And you can tell me in a minute. <clears throat> but don't get distracted from this, okay? <clears throat> this woman, well-known woman, <clears throat> Pentecostal uh, prosperity gospel preacher, bought a $250,000 car and gave it to another minister in the gospel. So that, that puts you in a pretty good situation when you can buy $250,000 gifts. And, and she boldly said that and, and, and uh, was believing and putting it out as a good thing. What about the two and a half million dollar uh, uh, <clears throat> New York apartment that one minister has? And he only goes there occasionally because he has several other homes. You know, probably worth more than that. But uh, every preacher needs a two million five hundred thousand dollar home. Now, many, yes, you got a number? Yes, I do. Uh, the fuel mileage on all these is 12 to 18 miles a gallon. It starts out at 300 and 312,000 and climbs up, as far as I can see, to 357,000. Okay, I stand totally correct. It's about 350,000 for a uh, Rolls Royce. Yeah. Okay, but sincerely, these are the type cars that some of these preachers have. 
Now, what the deal is in the congregation, the congregation is just trying to listen to them and follow them and read their books and do all that they say to do simply because they want to get in the position of having a $250,000 car. Okay, that's the, that's the goal here. And these preachers know that. And they work that to the utter limit, okay? <clears throat> what about the $10 million homes and estates that many of them have? Uh, Baptist preacher in, in, uh, in uh, North Carolina has a $10 million home. 35,000 square foot home tax free. That's a different one. He also wants the $64 million home. That's a different one. We'll talk about one of those in a minute. But a $10 million home. Okay? And um, and he was asked about it when it came out that he had it. And he said, oh, it's really not that much. <laughs> but what's interesting about that to me is he is a Baptist preacher. And it just shows that how, how much this is just infiltrated even a denomination like Baptist. Uh, when we were Baptist in, in that area, the idea was to keep the preacher as poor as possible. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm not really kidding with that. I mean, it was the thought that the preacher is supposed to sacrifice. So, uh, in a lot of cases, they paid them very poorly. So things have changed in 30-something years since we left that part of the country because now Baptist preachers can have $10 million homes that, that are really insignificant. It's, just, it's really not that much to it. Okay? Now, what about the man, the preacher, that needed in order to carry out his ministry in the fullest extent, he needed a $64 million plane uh, to go back and forth to do his ministry. He, he couldn't go commercial because he would be then exposed to demons in a long tube. And he just couldn't do that. <laughs> he, you know, he, he didn't say that, but another one of them did. That we, we have to have our own planes. Because, I mean, you just it just messes you up when you're sitting in that airplane with all those demons in that little narrow long tube. Okay. Now, this one is the one that is the, the sin for me. What about a, a minister of the gospel who's been preaching 40 plus years? It's probably around the 46, 48, somewhere in there. Years in ministry. Now, this preacher, out of his own mouth, boasting, is a billionaire. Not a M million, but a B billion. And he says, I have been appropriating that for a long, long time. And he smiled, acknowledging that he is a billionaire. Now, I wasn't real smart on a billion. I thought I knew what it was, but I wanted to make sure I should have wanted to make sure more about that Mercedes, I mean, about that Rolls Royce and Bentley. But uh, anyway, I apologize for that. But this is true. A million dollars is a thousand million. So if you think about some of these preachers of the prosperity gospel message, they are worth some 25,000, some 30, some 65,000, some 80. They're all in that range in terms of how much they have acquired and what they're worth. And we think, whoa, a preacher being worth 80,000, 80 million dollars? 80 million dollars. That's unbelievable. But then think about it here. This preacher is a billionaire. So he has a thousand millions. That, that's just change to him. When you've got a thousand millions and someone else has 30 million, to you, they're in poverty. 
<laughs> now, I want to take this further because there's there's vital truth here. I'm not telling you this for a joke. There's vital truth and information here. I want to give you four definitions of English words. And we're going to find two of them in the scriptures I'm going to read you in just a moment. So I want you to remember them. Avarice. That is to have desire to get and keep money. Avarice. Greed is wanting excessively to have or acquire, to desire more than one needs or deserves. So remember avarice and greed. Now, this is the word we're going to see in the English translation in just a moment when I read in another place in Scripture. Covetous or covetousness. Remember that one. That is the first two we just defined. Covetousness is defined as greed and avarice and inordinate desire for riches. So covenant, the word I want you really to remember, is the wrapped up meaning of the first two, avarice and greed. But it just simply means an inordinate desire for riches. Okay? Now, let's look at the word idolatry. Now, most all of us know the word idolatry. We know it means to worship uh, false idols or false gods or whatever. But Ephesians 5, 5 tells us something really important about this thing of idolatry. A covetous man is an idolatry. A covetous man is an idolatry. Now, what did we just say? A covetous man is one who is greedy. He's one who has avarice and an inordinate desire for riches. Okay? So think about those in the connection of the characteristics that we have seen Paul present for these men. I'm giving you this straight out of Scripture, okay? And let's think about what is going to happen to the people that Paul is talking about. And let's ask the question, if there are people that we can identify doing the same things in our day in the church, is the th same thing going to happen to them? I hope not. Paul was crying over this. He had more insight than I do. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. But Paul knew, the Holy Spirit, he, he was able to tell Paul what, what their fate was. Now let's listen to that once again. Paul spoke of the fate of those with the characteristics that we mentioned. And that fate was whose end is destruction. And that end referred to the ultimate destiny being destruction and uh, eternal destruction and ruin. That's what Paul said. Was where those false Christians, if they stayed where they were in their spiritual condition, they would spend an eternity separated from God in hell. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. You, you can't... I'm not twisting this. You, you see it for yourself. Now, follow carefully with me. Don't turn there because I'll be gone before you get there. But 1 Corinthians 5, 11 through 13 says this. Paul writes and he says, But actually I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. A Christian in the church in, in Corinth, he was specifically dealing with that man's sin and he was, he was telling the church what they should be doing about this man. So he says, I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother. Person claiming to be a Christian that's not. And this is some of the characteristics of those so-called brothers that we're not to associate with. One is an immoral person. 
And right along with that, the second is a covetous person. What did we say covetousness was? Greed, avarice, and an inordinate desire for riches. But the next word that he identifies them with is an idolater. What did we say an idolater was? An idolater is one who is a worshiper of false idols and gods. And Ephesians 5, 5 tells us that a covetous man is an idolater. So, basically Paul is saying here that there's some people that claim to be Christians that I'm telling you, don't even associate with them. Have nothing to do with them. And he begins to name them. Immoral persons and then covetous, idolaters, revilers, drunkards, swindlers, not even to eat with such a one. It's a pretty stiff statement. <clears throat> what if I wrote each of you a letter this coming week and named some people in the church and said, don't even eat with them. That's how bad they are. That's what Paul was doing. Now, you say, okay, <clears throat> I've had enough of this. I don't like what you're saying. I don't like what you're doing. Because you have no right to do and say what you're saying. Because the Bible is clear. Judge not lest you be judged. Exactly. You're right. But there's something you need to realize. And it's right here in Corinthians. Where we're reading from. Right in context. 1 Corinthians 5.12 says something very important. Paul is talking to the Corinthian Christians and he says, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? He's trying to say, I have no business judging a non-Christian. And he's wanting them to realize they have no business judging a, 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 a non-Christian. But listen to the second part of that verse. Do you not judge those are, who are within the church? Christians are to judge those who claim to be Christians in the church. If you want to read that this afternoon, you will find that Paul closes that little section out with telling them to kick that man who was committing the sin that he was talking about out of the church. Not only don't eat with him, but remove him from the church. You can read it for yourself, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Read the, read the whole chapter, and you'll see that I, what I'm saying is exactly the truth. Okay? So, Christians are to pass judgment on other Christians. Why would the Bible say do that? For the exact reason we're seeing here in Paul talking to the Philippians. Because there can be people in the church that claim to be Christians, and other people think they're Christians, and other people in the church or Christians begin to follow their practices that are non-Christian. And that's why Paul is weeping. Because there was just exactly those people in the Philippian church. And he was concerned about those in there who were true Christians and could be misled and deceived by the life and the teachings of these false people. And so that's why he's saying, you got to judge. You can't, what's that statement about a little leaven leavens the whole lump? One of Paul's statements. What about, what's that statement about an apple in a barrel? One bad apple. One what? One bad apple can ruin the whole barrel. Okay, and this is the position Paul is coming from. Now, I want to I want to tie this together now with this. This is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. It's in the context with what Paul is dealing with. And he says this, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? He's just named all these things that are unrighteous. Okay? And he says those who participate in those things will not go to heaven, is what he's saying. 
They will not inherit the kingdom of God. And he's saying to the Corinthians, you need to know that. Or do you not know that the, uh, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Now we're told to not be deceived because we can be deceived. So he's saying, don't let anybody deceive you. Then he gives a list again of those that are claiming to be Christians that Paul is saying will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now listen to that list. Adult uh, uh, starts off with um, do not be deceived, neither fornicators, he's saying neither meaning that will not inherit the kingdom of God, neither fornicators will inherit the kingdom of God, nor idolaters. <coughs> what were idolaters? They were covetous people. Those who were greedy. They had avarice. They had an inordinate desire for riches. They were a covetous person who Ephesians 5, 5 says is an idolater. And Paul right here is saying an idolater will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yet the people I'm talking about are leading people into idolatry. They're in it themselves and they're leading people into it nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, hear this, nor the covetous. And there we are back again with completing the circle. The covetous were greedy, avarice, in order and desire for riches, and a covetous man is an idolater nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The covetous and the idolaters were thrown in with the homosexuals to say it's all so bad and they don't have a relationship with Jesus that has removed this sin and is changing their life. And those who practice these things, Paul says, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now I say that with no joy. I pray for every one of these people that I'm using as an example. I'm not calling their name, but I've used examples of things they've said and done. And I pray for them. And I'm going to ask you to do that in a minute. Because God loves them. And they need to realize that all of this stuff that they have been acquiring throughout their life of supposedly being ministers of the gospel has been leading them in the exact wrong direction. They have believed that because they have acquired so much that they're right up there first in line in a relationship with God. I mean, look at how God's blessing me. Paul said, follow my example. Was Paul a billionaire? Was Paul even a one millionaire? <laughs> now, Paul was blessed to have something on his body enough to keep him warm at night. And he was blessed when he could get a good meal. That's the Paul of the New Testament. What about Jesus? Surely Jesus had some type of a well-bred donkey that was equivalent to a Rolls Royce. <laughs> <laughs> and, and no doubt, the saddle on that thing cost hundreds of thousands. <laughs> okay, I'm wrapping up. I'm serious with this. It's sad <clears throat> that much of the church in our day follows, exalts, and is deceived by these living lifestyles that Paul says cannot inherit the kingdom of God. 
<clears throat> when you follow one of these preachers, <clears throat> in some cases you will see that they draw thousands and thousands to their services. There are millions that listen to them on TV. And there are millions that read their books. So their message, believe me, is going out to more people and stronger than Paul's message here. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Their message is going out to more people and stronger than my message about what Paul has to say here. We have 43 people here today that are hearing the truth of the Word of God. But those people are reaching 43,000 and plus more with a falsehood. Now, if I have not presented this clearly enough from Scripture and you can't buy it, then just let it go, let it go on from one ear and out the other. Okay? That, that's fine with me. You don't have to believe like I believe. You don't have to see this scripture like I see it. You don't have to uh, make the application of it that I'm making for our day. But if you do see it, then I would ask you every time that God would bring these people to your mind that you would pray for them. And that you would pray for the people that are following them. Because the sad thing is, the people that gather and pack themselves into the places where these preachers preach, they are doing what that preacher says do for one reason, with the hope that they'll get as much stuff as he's got. So, he tells them to give, and they're going to get wealth like he has. But guess who's getting rich? Who's getting rich? We're not talking about the people in his congregation sitting in the pew that have the money to buy uh, $250,000 cars and give them away to someone that's important in their life. No, those people, many of them are sitting there hoping they're not going to lose their house. That they can listen to this preacher that says, you give $58 and pledge to give $58 a month for the next month, to this, for the next year, to this ministry, and you'll have that house paid off before the end of the year. And they're sitting there broke. And maybe I should give 580 but That would have to get it quicker. So I'm going to give them 580. This is the truth. And that's what they're thinking. And that's why they go to those services. Because they know that preacher is rich. And they know that he's got some insight they don't have. That if they will do what he says do, then they're going to get rich. And I want you to pray for those people. Join me in praying for them. Because Paul didn't want them to go to hell, and I don't want them to go to hell. And more importantly, God does not want them to go to hell. And coming to an awareness of what they're boasting in is the thing they should be ashamed of could bring them to a place of repentance. Because all they need to do is recognize their sin and the direct, wrong direction they're going in and do just like you and I did. Come to Jesus and ask for forgiveness. And that's what they need. And that's what needs to happen with many who are following them. Now many of those people that are following them are Christians, as Paul was talking, as Mike was talking about earlier. Many of those people have been saved somewhere else. They heard the truth somewhere and they got saved. 
but now they're just being sidetracked with false teaching and they have a wrong direction in their life. But some of these people have been lost from the beginning and are still lost. And some of them just have a, a good game going. Okay? So, as we close, please pray for them because I believe God lets us know things about people to take the action that the Word would tell us to, but also to know those things so that we might pray for them. The man that Paul said kick out in the Corinthian church that we're just reading about, the purpose for that was so that he might recognize his sin, be changed, and come back. Later on in Paul's writings, he makes the point of saying it's time to bring him back in. He's learned his lesson. And that's exactly what Paul will need him to do, was to learn a lesson. Get it going in the right direction. And Paul knew that if the church removed themselves from him or removed him from the church, that then he would begin to recognize why did they do that? And he would begin to recognize the sin in his life and want to get back. All um, treatment like that of anyone in the church is for the purpose of restoring them, not for the purpose of destroying them. So please join me with prayer at that. Now let me close. Uh, if you're here and you've never accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, I would encourage you to do that today. If you're a believer and you need to recommit your life to Christ, I would encourage you to do that. And uh, if you are a believer and have never been water baptized, I would ask you to come and meet with me after the service so that we can schedule a baptismal service for you. Water baptism does not save, but water baptism is an important thing for every Christian to do. So let me know about that. We have the option, uh, thankfully, to Robert and Lee to put you under warm and me not lose you downstream. <laughs> or to put you in the, in the river, freezing cold, and my feet could slip on the rock and just drop you and you'd wind up and start. <laughs> Yeah. But but seriously, I, I'm serious about that. If you're not followed in believers' baptism, I would encourage you to do that. Also, if you have any kind of a prayer need today, uh, let the prayer team go be at the right of the room to close the service. Let them pray for you. This is our invitation. This is the way we do it. A little different than some people, but it's an invitation to go and let them pray for you. And I want to say thank you to our prayer team. They are awesome. They seek God. They pray. They know that they can't do anything apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And they are anointed to pray for you. And I would encourage you to go and let them pray for you in whatever way you need. Our offering bucket is to the left of the doors as you exit. If you would like to help me get a $250,000 Rolls Royce, <laughs> <laughs> no, I say that jokingly, but sincerely, I will say this to someone that doesn't know. And this is not a boast. This is a fact that you can know. That this church, money that comes in, we support eight different ministries locally and around the world and a benevolent fund through the church. So this church, praise God, is involved in supporting uh, and financing people in need uh, and getting the gospel out and meeting people's needs in nine different areas. So uh, I won't be getting my Rolls Royce until we change that. Okay? So God bless you. Thank you for being here. You're dismissed. Have a great rest of the day.